Well, good morning, everyone. And uh, if you have a Bible, please turn to the passage that was just read to us from John chapter 5. And I want to draw out this one main point this morning. But first, let's pray. Lord, we ask that by your Spirit and through your Word, you would speak to us and you would change us and you would help us to live a life that honours you and a life that flourishes and is all that you intend it to be. Amen. <clears throat> Over four decades ago when I was baptised as a, a teenager, I was given a Bible and uh, in it, my sponsor wrote a verse that in some respects has proved prophetic for me and for my life subsequently. And that verse was in 2 Timothy 2 and verse 15. And uh, he quoted from the old King James, the old authorized version. And that verse says this, study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needn't be ashamed, but rightly divides the word of truth. Study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that doesn't need to be ashamed and rightly divides the word of truth. And I think certainly for the last three decades as a minister, I've worked at studying God's word and trying to rightly understand it and divide it and teach it. But in so doing, I've been thinking these last two weeks, I've been off sick for two weeks, and this thought's been going around my mind, who have I done it for? Have I been seeking approval from people? Or have I been seeking approval from God? Have I been looking to him to see if there's a smile on his face for his yes? for his affirmation, for his commendation? Or have I been doing it for others? When I was a teenager, I certainly wanted the approval of my peers and my mates. And I know that that led me to act in ways that I knew that God would not approve of. I became a person I don't think God approved of. I didn't even approve of myself. But I wanted the approval of my peers. That mattered more than the approval of God. When I was a, a student studying for degrees and so on, I wanted the approval of my tutors and my professors. And I worked really hard to be the best student I could be and to get the best grades that I could be. Actually, I was doing it because I wanted the approval it wasn't simply the pursuit of knowledge and learning and excellence. It was about gaining approval. As a young adult, newly married to my amazing wife, I wanted the approval of my father-in-law. And he never gave it. <laughs> and uh, on one occasion he said to Tiffany, well, if you will marry someone who prays for a living, as a young minister, I wanted the approval of my colleagues and church members. Uh, 25, 23, 25 years on, I still remember how big and how swollen I felt when a former rector here, David McInnes, who I sort of admired and had, had looked up to for so long, said that one of my sermons was electric. And I thought, yes, the approval of the master preacher. <laughs> And, uh, and then I remembered shortly thereafter when I preached a sermon and I looked to him to see what he thought of it. And he said, yeah, it was okay. <laughs> and I withered from being flattered to being flattened just like that. I remember some years ago saying to my pal Frank Curry, who sat in the back, uh, I was just sort of sharing my insecurities and feelings of inadequacy, and he tried to give me a reality check, and he said, get over yourself, you're just not that important. <laughs> I think he was trying to help. <laughs> and he, he didn't. <laughs> Where 
Are we looking for approval in our lives? To whom do we look? In our reading, Jesus challenges the Pharisees in their religion. He says in verse 39, you study the scriptures, but you fail to honor the one that they honor. You're studying the book, but the book points to Jesus and glorifies, glorifies him, and yet you, re, you reject him, you're not seeking him. You're just studying scripture for its own sake rather than the goal, which is him. In verse 44 of our reading, Jesus says, you grasp at glory from one another, but you do not seek the glory that comes from the only God. Whose approval, whose honor, whose rating are you seeking? Elsewhere, Jesus said about the Pharisees that they do their religion to be approved by others. He said they love to be honored in the marketplaces. They love to have the best seats at banquets. He, he says that they have their prayer shawls and they design them in such a way that the tassels at the bottom are sticking out and uh, these symbolize prayer and they want to be seen to be people of prayer. He says they make a real show at giving their money to the poor, but it's not because they care about the poor, it's because they want to be seen to be generous. And Jesus summed up their religious motivation in John 12 and verse 43. He says, you love the approval of people more than the approval of God. And the sad thing is that by seeking mainly the approval of people, they forfeited and missed the approval of God. The fact is many of us are approval junkies and we're looking for it in all the wrong places. And we're living for the approval at times of the wrong persons rather than for the audience of one. The one whose value judgment on us really matters. And whether it be how many friends or followers we have on Facebook or Instagram or Twitter or TikTok, I don't have any of those. I do have a podcast, how many people follow that, or how many likes or emoji hearts we receive on a post, acting in certain ways against our conscience, amongst our peers, at work, so at college, so as to be noticed and approved. We're seeking our sense of worth and value from others rather than the one whose approval really matters. And it's so unhealthy, but it's so common, even amongst Christians. Approval junkies become inauthentic. They don't know who they are, but they seek to be what they think others want them to be. The problem is most people see through that kind of needy facade and often only people approve of them because they themselves are approval junkies wanting approval in return. I was interested yesterday, my son Nathaniel told me there's a new social media app photo site called Be Real. I, I like that. Apparently people at some point in the day upload a photo of, their, uh, of themselves, a sort of true selfie in the moment that hasn't been edited. And it's a kind of attempt to counter the fakery of a sort of Instagram airbrushed lies. But I wonder even in doing that, how many people are really craving approval? You know, this is the real me, but what do you think of me. Approval junkies are superficial because they live a persona and their focus is on externals, it's on the surface, it's on the impression they give, it's makeup, it's made up, it's a veneer, it's never real and it never deals with the deep matters of the nurture and development of the character and of the soul. It's Approval junkies are on a kind of roller coaster from a high to a low, depending on that hit of approval that they gain. Self worth and self esteem and a confidence boost and an emotional stroke that comes from the validation of others. 
but it's driven by insecurity and a sense of inferiority and inadequacy, perhaps self-rejection, fear of rejection. And all these things are toxic for the soul. And that was the mark of the religion of the Pharisees, a desire for external validation. They looked for glory from others rather than from the one whose approval and glory and opinion and value judgment really matters. Marlena Dietrich was, uh, many of you know, a famous singer, actress and style icon from the 30s through to the 60s, really. And uh, she herself, despite being this gifted woman and beauty, was plagued by insecurity. And she was serially promiscuous, just grasping at moments of approval, as if by having yet another lover, that would be a yes to her, an approval of her in her femininity, in her sexuality, in her womanhood. Just grasping for glory, for approval. I read that she used to record the audience applause at her concerts. And when friends came round for dinner, she would play the applause. What do you think? They're all applauding me. What do you think? What do you think? Fantastic, fantastic. How sad. Someone's so gifted and yet so insecure. And the reality is it doesn't matter what we have achieved in the eyes of the world. Sometimes inside we can just be so broken and so beaten up. And where are we going to get that approval from? because it will never satisfy us if we're seeking to get it from what we achieve, from our performance, from our peers, from our parents. It never satisfies. There's only one place that we can go for it. Therapists will say that the antidote to being an approval junkie is to approve of yourself. And maybe that's true, but how do you get to approve of yourself and what are you to approve? I think the main focus of the way of Jesus is that we're to live in the approval of God who saw us from afar and he loved us and knows the very worst about us. He knows the truth and yet doesn't say no to us. In Christ Jesus says yes to us. Secondly, the approval we seek is found through the approval that we give. It's not wrong in one sense to seek approval and glory and honor. I actually believe we are ontologically wired for it. It's as old as Eden when our first forefathers fell. And St. Paul says they lost their glory. They fell short of the glory. And they felt shame and they felt nakedness. This pursuit of glory, this pursuit of approval is really a pursuit at the core of our being to replace what was lost at the beginning when our first forefathers sinned. And ever since it is, as it were, naked and approval and honor and affirmation and success is an attempt to cover that sense of nakedness and shame. Preacher Tim Keller says, the desire for God's approval is at the center of our souls. It's at the core of our being. But it's also at the core of his being because he's the God who wants to approve us, who wants to say yes to us. And that deep, gnawing, inchoate longing for God's yes over our lives that drives us in so many ways to achieve and to find all sorts of substitutes can indeed be fulfilled when we hear the Father say yes to us. The sad thing is that the approval of the one who matters the most is often the approval that we seek the least. How do we seek the approval of God. How do we find that? How do we hear that? Where does that come to us? Well, it's not by performance. And it's not by our purity. And it's not by being a perfect person. It's not by our sacrificial giving or our 
passionate devotion or intensity of our worship or how much we pray. Or, is that nothing like that? We receive the honor of the Father when we honor his Son. We receive his honor when we honor his Son. In John 5, verse 22, it says, The Father has assigned all judgment to the Son so that all may honor the Son just as they honor the Father. Whoever does not honor the Son doesn't honor the Father who sent him. And how are we to honor the Son? Well, in our passage, do have a look at it. Jesus explains how the Pharisees have failed to honor him. And it shows us how indeed we are to honor the Son and then receive the Father's honor. It says in verse 38 of chapter 5, he says that you haven't taken my word to live in you. We receive the Father's honor as we honor the Son, and we honor the Son by taking his word into us. And repeatedly here at St. Aldate's, we encourage people to take this word, to feast on it, to eat it, to consume it, to love it, to let it be the North Star, the Pole Star, the direction, the foundation for our life, to take his word into us. Verse 38, he says, you haven't believed in the one God sent. We honor, we receive the Father's honor when we honor the Son by receiving him as the one that the Father sent to us. Verse 40 says that you haven't come to Jesus to receive life. We receive the Father's honor when we honor the Son, when we come to the Son and say, help, I need you to give me life, the fullness of life and eternal life and new life, which is the reason why he was sent. Verse 42, it says that we receive the Father's honor as we honor the Son when we have God's love in us. When we welcome him into our lives, the God of love, and we experience that love and we express it to others. And then verse 43 says that, as it were, we receive the honor of the Father by honoring the Son when we receive Jesus. It all focuses and centers around you. Jesus is the criterion. If we want the honor, the favor, the affirmation, the yes of God on our life, then we say yes to Jesus. It's as simple as that. But it's never less than that. The bar for God's approval is not set impossibly high. And we don't have to climb some spiritual Everest. And it's all gift. It's actually receiving the Son. And when we say yes to God's gift to us in Christ Jesus, he says yes to us. And then thirdly and finally, Jesus lived for the approval from above. It's how Jesus lived. He knew what was in people's hearts. He knew how fickle they were. He knew one day they could cheer him on as he entered into Jerusalem at Passover. And he knew that three days later they would jeer at him and scorn him and ridicule him and reject him. And that those who said hallelujah would be those who said crucify him. So he knew how fickle they were. And he wasn't looking to them for approval. St. Peter at Pentecost in the very first sermon ever preached in the church, by the church, makes a statement about Jesus and the very first statement ever made about Jesus in the very first sermon, on the very first day that the church is constituted, said, Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved by God. He's the one approved by God and he lived in that approval and he lived for that. Jesus said, I seek not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. He said, I, I do not receive glory from people. And he was attentive to the Father's eye. He always had his eye on what the Father wanted and what the Father willed. And the greatest thing for him was not the adulation of the crowds, but it was the yes of God. It was the yes of his Father. And he received that yes. 
on three occasions, and you'll know in Scripture when, when a theme is repeated three times, it's a kind of Hebraic idiom, and it's very important. But on three occasions, heaven, as it were, opened, and the Father speaks. At the baptism of Jesus, a voice from heaven says, this is my Son in whom I'm well pleased. This is my boy. And then at the transfiguration, as Jesus turns his face towards Jerusalem and the denouement of the drama begins, again, heaven from the cloud, from heaven, a voice says, this is my beloved son, listen to him. And then as the cross drew near, Jesus prays, my soul is troubled, yet, Father, glorify your name. And a voice from heaven says, I have glorified it, and I will. On three occasions, three key moments, the Father's yes to the Son. Have you ever heard God say yes to you? Have you ever heard? What really matters is the voice from heaven. It's not the voice from earth. And so often we're scratching around and pursuing and seeking that. But that's the one that matters. Eric Clapton, the legendary blues guitarist, rock star, uh, what a genius he is in many ways. Also a terribly tortured soul. And I don't know if you know his story, but he... He became a drug addict and a sex addict and a buying addict. He was just a, a, an addict. And uh, really he was attempting to fill this great craving and gnawing and emptiness that was in his soul. And how did that originate? Well, he grew up without his father. His mother uh, from Bradford um, was just a, a sort of young lady, and she met a Canadian airman called Edward Fryer. He was just based here at the end of the Second World War, and they just had a fleeting one-night stand, and she became pregnant, and he flew off and never returned. And she gave birth to Eric Clapton. And um, he was brought up in a very strange setup, told that his mother was actually his older sister, and it was all very weird. But he lived this life of great brokenness and just this ache inside him. And uh, whether it was excelling at being the best guitarist in the world, that he probably was one of, uh, or, or, or then with the fame and fortune that came with it, just trying to satiate this need in him. Some of you know one of his most famous songs called Father's Eyes. He says, sailing down behind the sun, waiting for my prince to come, praying for the healing rain to restore my soul again. My father's eyes, when I look in my father's eyes, my father's eyes, he knew the, the source of that pain. But of course, he never experienced the healing of it. And what we need is the father in heaven's eyes and his yes and his approval and his glory and for him to say that's my boy and the fact is you have such a father and he is waiting and longing and willing to speak that over you that voice from heaven this is my son this is my daughter in whom I'm well pleased and as I've said it's not predicated on your performance it's just on whether you said yes to his yes to you in sending his son Jesus and welcomed him. I recall a brilliant world-class academic here, honored by his peers, literally world-class academic and leader and uh, adored by students and jealous and yet preened by the fellow peers and successful in everything they did and they just looked so cool and they made lots of money and, and I knew them well. I remember them coming to me for prayer. I was just aware that despite all of this success and honor and fame, <laughs> there was an insecurity 
in them that had actually driven them to these great heights but had not satisfied them. And one day I was praying with them and praying for them and I just heard the Lord say to say to them from that passage I quoted earlier, to say, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. And here's this top prof, I said, this, God says this, this is, you are his son in whom he is well pleased, not because of what you've achieved, but because of who you are and because you follow him and seeking to. And I remember this man who's shorter than me, he just lost it. He broke. And I held him, and I had like a gray tank top on, you know, a woolly tank top. It was in the days, you know, when I was trying to be not as cool as I am now with a leather waistcoat. But, and he sobbed, and he sobbed, and he sobbed. One of the most important blokes in the city. And he sobbed, and he sobbed, and he sobbed. Because that's what he needed. PhDs and, and chairs and money and public aid. All those things have great worth. I'm not denying a, 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 that in the slightest. You be the best you can be in every way you can. But what really mattered was hearing that God loved him. Have you ever heard the father say that he approves of you? Have you ever heard him say he approves of you? Say yes to his son. And by the spirit you'll hear him say a whopping great yes to you. In Tolkien's Lord of the Rings, Sam Ganji honors Lord Faramir. And Faramir says the praise of the praiseworthy is above all rewards. The praise of the praiseworthy, the honor, the approval of the one who is to be approved is above all rewards. And God is just waiting to say yes over your life. And he does that every time you say yes to his son. Let's be those who live in the approval of God. Amen.